Hello and welcome to Heparin-Induced Thrombocytopenia. My name is David Woodruff, and I began my career as a paramedic, working out in the field for a number of years before I went to nursing school. That gave me the opportunity to be able to see the healthcare setting from the outside. And one of the things I really enjoyed about that was seeing the nurses at the bedside providing the care. That really got me fired up to be able to provide the care to the patient, be able to see the kind of outcomes that occur as a result of the care that we give. So that's why I got into nursing. After uh, graduating from nursing school, I worked in a variety of different settings, including coronary care, medical intensive care, surgical intensive care, neuro intensive care, and a level one trauma center. I've taught medical surgical nursing for 10 years now and critical care nursing for three years, along with continuing education for the past 12. So I've got a variety of experiences that I hope to share with you today as we talk about heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Now, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia and thrombocytopenias in general are a collection of conditions that cause the platelet count to decrease. There's a lot of different ways that platelets can become activated and depleted in the clotting process, and most commonly, that's going to be the result of drops in platelet counts that are caused by pre-existing conditions such as sepsis, trauma, or surgery. But approximately 5% of patients that receive heparin will develop an immune response that activates platelets, causing life-threatening clotting and occasional bleeding. This thing is what's called heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Now, heparin is available to our patients in a variety of different ways. For example, sometimes our patients on a heparin infusion. For example, those patients who have clots or pulmonary emboli might be on some kind of infusion of heparin. In addition, many of our patients have heparin flushes of central lines and other types of lines that might expose them even to just small amounts of heparin. It is thought that even these tiny little amounts of heparin can be enough to sensitize your patient to heparin and cause them to develop heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. In addition, of course, we often give heparin subcutaneously, and even our low molecular weight heparins, such as Lovenox, can also cause the patient to have a heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Now, what happens here is that heparin is a drug that usually is going to inhibit platelets from forming clots by inactivating thrombin and decreasing the platelet function directly. That's how it normally works. But what happens in heparin-induced thrombocytopenia is instead we're getting an activation of platelet activating factor 4. And this platelet activating factor 4 is then going to contact immune globulin G, forming an immune complex. And this immune complex then activates platelets causing clotting. Okay, take a look at this picture here. It's showing our heparin plus this platelet factor 4 combined with immune globulin G and that complex then goes down and activates the platelet. So this is the thing that's causing platelets to become activated. See, normally heparin is going to keep the platelet from becoming activated, but it's this combination here that's occurring with the platelet factor 4 and that immune globulin G. It's that combination coming together that is activating those platelets and doing just the reverse of what we normally would expect to see in a patient who is receiving um, heparin. Now, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia can occur in one of three different onsets. The most common one is the typical onset. We'll get to that in a minute. Let's talk about the early onset. Early onset occurs within 24 hours. So you got a patient that comes in, we start them on the heparin, boom, within 24 hours, this guy's got heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. More typically, what happens is that the onset occurs about 5 to 10 days after heparin has begun. So maybe our patient is on this heparin drip, our patient's getting a subcutaneous heparin, whatever the case may be, and 5 to 10 days after therapy has begun, that's when the patient starts to have heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. 
Now, again, if your patient has a central line that we're flushing with a heparinized solution, you see how this would be a very common type of scenario in those cases. I mean, patients usually are not on heparin drips for this long a period of time. So they're probably encountering the heparin from some other mechanism. 70% of your patients have this typical onset of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Now, we also have a delayed onset, which occurs several days after heparin is stopped. Okay, so the heparin's even gone at this point, and the patient develops heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Now, remember again that heparin-induced thrombocytopenia is going to decrease the platelet count. In fact, if we're seeing a platelet count decrease by 30% or more in our patient, we have to be thinking about heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, especially if that patient is on any form of heparin at all. Interestingly, postoperative cardiac and orthopedic patients have the highest risk for developing heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, then followed by our medical patients, and then by OB patients, okay? So if you're looking for who is going to be the patient who's going to develop this stuff, those are the patients. Look for those postoperative cardiac and orthopedic patients first because they have the highest risk. So what happens then is that the platelets become activated, and these activated platelets are going to cause clotting. The primary symptoms of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia are going to be the results of clotting. We do deplete the platelets, and the patient gets a very low platelet count, but bleeding is really rather rare. Now, when you look at this diagram here, you might be saying to yourself, well, geez, you know, I think if the platelets became activated, I'd see a depleted platelet count, which would result in bleeding. But again, that's a rare situation. Actually, most often what happens is what's on the left. So in other words, the depleted platelets or the activated platelets cause clotting, which is then going to cause the patient to develop venous thromboemboli, myocardial infarction, CVAs, and other emboli in the body. Venous thromboembolism occurs in about 35 to 75 percent of patients who have heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. So really be looking at those extremities. Be looking for that venous thromboemboli. Venous thromboembolism can lead to limb ischemia and even tissue death. And if the patient develops limb ischemia, about 20% of those patients are going to require an amputation. So big deal here. Watch for those venous thromboemboli. 30% of our patients end up dying of thromboembolic complications. And you can see why when you see the severity of the kind of stuff that they're going to get. Treatment includes immediate discontinuation of all heparin products, okay? It flushes everything. Get the heparin away from the patient, including those low molecular weight heparins. Treat the clotting with other coagulants, anticoagulants here. Uh, you know, these are some other anticoagulants that work in different ways that aren't going to be messing with that platelet that's already becoming activated and, and messing with our platelet counts. Avoid platelet transfusions because remember they're being activated. If you give more platelets, at least in theory, more become activated and we get more clots. So bad deal there. We also want to avoid warfarin. This can cause tissue necrosis in some of our patients. So we want to avoid switching that patient from heparin over to warfarin. Assess for signs of thromboembolism. That's the big one there, okay? This is the big risk with heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Can't stress it enough. Look for those thromboemboli. Hey, we got a lot of other great resources for you. Come on over to edfornurses.com. Lots of great resources for you there. And those of you who are students, check out edforstudentnurses.com. Another great site. Lots of great resources for you. I want to get you all directed toward our two-minute EBP challenge. Help you to stay up to date on what's happening in nursing. It's easy. Comes to your email box on Friday. You get to enter the contest every week to win a copy of my 101 Tips to Improve Your Nursing nursing care book. I want to thank you all for joining me for heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Join me for other YouTube videos. Check us out at youtube.com slash edfornurses. Thanks for joining me.